to the regularly scheduled Shelburne Select Board meeting of July 10th, 2018, which we now call to order. The first item is to consider approving the agenda. Is there discussion from anybody? Nope. And from the public? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? Move to approve the agenda. Jamie moves. Second. Mary seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And for the record, uh, uh, the select board member, Colleen Parker, has not yet arrived, and we'll note when she does. Uh, the next item is to consider approving select board meeting minutes of June 26, 2018. Several of us probably have the same comment, but I'll note that on page three, number nine, in the, in the Lee Susskind should be Lee Kroon. And while we're at it, number 10, it probably should read Lee Kroon instead of Kroon. Are there any other yeah, on, uh, corrections? On the uh, number two. Two? Uh, on the motion about the Vermont Railroad, um, I didn't vote, so that would be a three to zero vote. Thank you, Josh. I have one additional change on item 14 on the motion we made waiving the fee for the DRB application for the mm -hmm. town center. I just wanted to make it clear that I, I think what we were trying to articulate was that the Planning and Zoning Office would be credited, essentially, for the revenue, the phantom revenue, so to speak, as far as their own goals go. I don't know. It sort of said that it's for the work done. I just wanted to make it clear that that was the intention of the motion, even if it wasn't and we, stated. And by our commentary tonight, such. we can... Uh, uh, reassure the office that that's our intent right. uh, it does say appropriate recognition and uh, we can we'll ask yeah. Lee to make it as specific as it needs to be agreed we were all agreed right. on that with those corrections are is there any other discussion any discussion in the public no is there a motion to approve as corrected so moved by Mary, Second. seconded by Josh. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those uh, disapproving, nay. The ayes have it. Thank you. The next item is public comments. Do you want to the minutes from? I don't know that we're prepared to do there. last night's, yesterday's. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I anticipated we'd do that on the 26th, Josh. Public comments. Any? Hearing none, thank you. Select board comments. Uh, I'd like to lead, if I could, and that's to recognize uh, a, a number of staff persons, uh, Josh Floor and Bruce Berlin, who have just been appointed sergeants in the police department. We uh, congratulate them, and if you uh, uh, were aware of the process that was followed, it was extremely, uh, I, th I thought, well done, very methodical, very deliberate, involved a great number of, of, of persons representing both the community and the law enforcement profession. Uh, it was a very impressive uh, account that the chief provided. And to the two new sergeants, congrats and welcome. Uh, I'd also like to recognize Ted Nelson, the assessor, in the process uh, yesterday of m making decisions on uh, tax rate. Uh, Peter Frankenberg, who's with us, uh, reviewed uh, the entire situation of budget and revenue and such. Uh, sometime uh, almost, well, nine or ten months ago, Ted Nelson made a projection of what he thought as the assessor the grand list would be. That's, of course, a basic fundamental figure for budgeting, uh, what, what's your revenue base? And the actual figure turned out to be within hundredths of a percent. That's a pretty extraordinary 
uh, accomplishment uh, in anybody's language. And I think Ted uh, can know that not only does that make, does that pr uh, create a lot of confidence in budgeting as we now go forward to another year, but uh, it's a mark of, of absolute professionalism and, and dedication. And his uh, associate, Betty Jean Bogue, is also to be commended for her role in uh, it recently in a series of parcel size data uh, changes that were made by the assessor's office, uh, very few of which uh, resulted in uh, levels of concern that, that uh, required sit down. She handled it so very well that virtually uh, the entire uh, number of residents affected uh, were pleased with explanation and outcomes, and it's greatly to her credit, uh, certainly a benefit to the town that uh, she was uh, so skillful and, and committed to her role. So we thank, uh, on behalf of all of us, we thank all of these four. Uh, we're very fortunate to have their service. Josh? Uh, yeah, I just add as list of commendations. Um, Peter's work on getting putting together the tax um, information for us it was very efficiently put together and clearly defined and made it our job much easier. So thank you, Peter. Same, all the way around. <laughs> Agreed. No, no comments. No, thanks, Peter. Appreciate it. Any. Any other? Hearing none, uh, the next item is the town manager report. Just uh, working hard with staff to keep all sorts of initiatives moving forward. Things seem to be moving along smoothly, and I appreciate everyone's efforts. It's been a great, a great team effort. Um, three initiatives we are pursuing. One uh, with, with all the emergency responding agencies working to become a heart-safe community which is a recognition that there's a certain level of training, availability of external defibrillators and other equipment that <clears throat> allows us to be recognized, as did Charlotte and other communities, as a community that cares about these things. And we're working to help get more and more people trained to respond in an emergency incident, a cardiac arrest. Also, um, pursuing joining in with the state of Vermont on what's called VT Alert. It's an emergency notification system that would allow us, if there were a water main break, a major accident, a major weather incident about to happen, uh, that we could push out notifications on a geo-referenced area or to everyone within a, a certain area. Um, none of these things have any cost associated with them. They're just helpful tools to have in our toolbox. The third one we're pursuing with the health department is called a closed pod or point of distribution. And if there were going to be some sort of epidemic or other medical incident that could affect large numbers of people, it would allow us to be pre-qualified to distribute preemptive medications to mission critical staff to keep people healthy. So police, fire, rescue, water, sewer, town staff can remain healthy and continue to serve the community when things happen while the state were to ramp up and distribute medications to broader populations. Again, no cost to that, working with Rescue, who has a licensed physician as their medical advisor, who would be the person to oversee that process. So what kind of things, where would, where would, how would that be instituted? So, um, as you might imagine, there are certain agreements and memoranda to create, but um, then it would, the state, there are a number of communities or emergency response agencies that are pre-qualified to be this, what's called the closed pod. So then the state has stockpiles of certain medicines in advance, and if there were something about to happen, then we would end up with that emergency oh. stockpile here so, that could be distributed on a rapid basis. So assuming that was an outbreak in a certain part of the state, you would want to contain that outbreak. Is yes. that the purpose? And again, keep mission critical staff healthy to be able to deliver critical services, again, while the state were to ramp up for a broader distribution to the population at large. Would it be rescue that would maintain that, those medications? The state maintains the stockpile, but then rescue through its licensed physician would be authorized to distribute that to those. Oh, to access, okay, so we wouldn't physically store. I don't believe so. Uh, fantastic. 
because we wouldn't know what to have unless no, they sure. were stockpiling something in yeah. advance. Well. So I just want to let you know those are three initiatives we are pursuing with our partners while keeping everything else with the ship of state moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Questions? Any discussion? How come he doesn't have a mic? It's hard to hear him. He doesn't have a mic, so it's hard to hear. Oh. Uh, an accident of setup. Sorry. For the time, why don't you borrow? Yeah. You know, you know, yeah. Thank you. Good observation. Uh, we can share that. Hard hearing. We can't Sorry really tell that. up here. <laughs> <laughs> there are also two wireless mics available if anybody needs that. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Any other comment or discussion? The next item is the Town Manager Search Committee, and Kathy Brooks and Roger Price are here uh, to, to make a presentation on uh, the progress to date. <coughs> we welcome them, and thank you. And I'm going to recuse myself from this conversation. And Lee will absent himself. Not that I'm not interested. I was going to say, <laughs> the best part. Good evening. Oops, I always do this. Okay. Um, well, as you know, we were charged with um, finding a new town manager. So we got together. We have a group of 15 of us, and we've met several times. Um, so at this point, we have we sent out RFPs to a number of firms. We got back a limited number of responses. Um, we prioritized and looked through the responses. And we in, ended up interviewing a couple of them um, by phone. And after the interview process, we recommend that um, MRI, Municipal Research Resources, is the firm that we would recommend going with. Um, they have the depth and the breadth of experience. Um, quite frankly, the other firms just didn't bring, they were out of the market area and didn't bring the same um, robust experience that we were looking for within the area. So um, we have done some reference checking on them, and we did it from both perspectives. We actually um, interviewed some people from the town, but I also talked to a couple of the candidates to help understand if they were comfortable with the process. And on both sides, we got back that they were a very professional firm and highly recommended. And both um, groups said that their select boards or their town committees also were very satisfied and, in fact, hoped they didn't have to rehire them again soon, but, but would if they had to. So um, up to this point, we are now in a place where I'd like to talk to you about the process that we would recommend going forward, um, working with, with MRI. The first thing they would do is advertise in national and regional local government publications. And we have a sample ad, and we have reviewed the different publications. And quite frankly, you know, we're, and looking at the returns and the, the payback for them, um, it is probably better to stick to a lot of the, the municipal towns and the different states, um, municipal groups, because that's where they find they get the most bang for the buck and the best responses. However, we're not going to limit ourselves to that, but we they have given us the feedback and the searches. That's where they get a lot of the, the best candidates. They also have pools of candidates. As you know, they've done, they did the Essex search recently and have done several other, you know, local searches. So not only do they do advertising, but they also do outreach and active recruiting. So after um, they get in the, the resumes and the candidates, from the candidates, they would then start to, they would screen the candidates and make a list of viable candidates for us. We will leave the resume and that piece of the um, recruitment open for about 30 days to make sure that we cast a wide enough net. And then after that, and they're going to do a lot of the screening for us, I think that will really simplify and alleviate 15 people looking at, quite frankly, maybe 100 to 400 resumes. Because whenever you get a pool like that, there's a certain segment of them 
that are just not qualified, you know, and then there's, a, there's another segment that are marginally qualified, and then typically you have a much smaller group that can be considered viable candidates. So what they propose to do is invite the applicants with relevant education and experience um, for interviews and to answer some essay questions. And then they would also look at the public data on the candidates. So they, they would start to screen them already, you know, throughout the process. They would also conduct telephone interviews with the top candidates. And we'd ask them to in, uh, identify the top six candidates for local interviews. And I think we all had some discussions about that previously. Um, we're thinking that if we can get a pool of six good candidates to bring in initially, that would give us enough of a pool for, for um, the board and everybody to look at. And then we would have local interviews and then um, you know, bring it down to the background, to the finalist. And the board would then you know, be in the position to select a finalist. So that's the proposed process. And we're hoping that it takes you know, it probably will take no longer than 120 days. That's the outside, but we're hoping that it's closer to 90 days, obviously. We're all aware of the time constraints that everyone's feeling under. So there has been an ad that has been drafted, and I believe, do you have the ad? You have it? Yeah, that uh, was where it. was that? That was it. I, I received it like 5.30ish. Oh, okay. Oh. Where, where, from, where, from Roger had sent yeah. it to me. Okay, so, so there is and a, this. This has been reviewed by some more. the town attorney. I think yes. a couple of tweaks have been made. <coughs> there are five copies. Okay, it's exactly the draft. It was the draft minus one word. Right. Thank you, Roger. Do you want to a survey? Sure. And um, part of the process is um, a survey that MRI and that we would you use with MRI to go out to the town and give people the opportunity to have some input. And I think, Roger, would you like to discuss the survey? How's that for, yeah. I'm, I'm Roger Price. I also wanted to say that um, management resources, Don Jutton, who's the founder, has been assigned to this project. And though we interviewed one firm over the phone, Don Jutton came here in person, and he spent a couple hours with us. He's a consummate professional. There'll be three people at MRI assigned to this project. So they're, they're my, personally, I find them to be excellent in what they're doing. One of the things they offered us is a, a survey that can be done by invitation to people in the town, or we can broadcast it widely and elicit input from the town, select board, our committee, um, employees, whatever, and that's, we chose to, we, we're going to do that. Um, and probably very soon it'll end up on the website of the town website and we'll invite people to respond. And then they will collate all this data and provide us with a report summarizing. Um, it's not really what, what's, it's what we would like to see. It's an involved survey. I have two drafts here, which I didn't want to, I'll show you. The first draft um, it was being disseminated from MRI. And we thought it might be nice if we were able to change the intro to it to say uh, our committee would like the response. Sure. So here is, it's not quite final, but um, we'll be probably tomorrow. So the, this is the survey from MRI, and I have a, a one page edition which changes the intro paragraph. This says it's, we are asking for this committee. Um, and I think. That's and this is intended to, to, to get opinions and views of desirable attributes, skills and attributes of, of a manager. What are the goals in the town here? This is only change here. It's just, this, is, this is the intro paragraph there is the paragraph. We're, we're, we're just tweaking. The content of the survey isn't changed at all. It's just the intro paragraph. Gotcha. And assuming that the contract is approved, I imagine you'll see this as well as advertisement very quickly. And during the first 30 days, they'll develop an ideal candidate profile. Um, and also this, this um, once they cull through the responses, also at, at, just to mention, MRI has never seen more than 150 responses to the survey. We may get more, but our, our town, you know, there's thousands of people that could respond. Um, 
whatever they get, and it can be done online, they prefer not to have written surveys, but they can for those people who don't have computers. So we, we, we'll, we'll probably put it on front porch forum too, at least that was the suggestion. Um, and I, I haven't seen the report, but we'll get one. Um, and when, after we, after they present to us, and everything's done in collaboration with our committee, and of course we share with you guys, we will create into three interview panels. There will be panels, probably be a citizens panel, which will be the, our committee. There'll be a, a panel of um, people who are professionals, other town managers and the like, and a panel that will be employees. And the process of selecting those people will be talked about. So we won't have all the town employees. Um, the, it's a two-day process. The people, will, the six finalists or whatever, how many finalists will come. Usually there's three interviews in the morning and three in the afternoon. Each candidate will spend an hour with each panel in the morning and then an hour in the afternoon. We're asked to have no discussion about the candidates until the end of the day when there will be a debrief. It'll be facilitated by MRI. And at that point, we'll make a recommendation of those candidates we would like to refer on day two to the select board. I think that's pretty much it. Is the committee looking at more than six resumes, or is MRI delivering six to the committee? M MRI is happy to deliver all the resumes. We as a committee have said their are right. we, Well, I, it, it, it may be more, okay. but it's not going to be. They, they're, the ideal number for them to, is to give us not less than six viable candidates. Okay. And if there's an internal candidate, there could be seven. So. And if they're 10, we should be so lucky. Right. <laughs> why, would, why would an internal candidate be evaluated differently? No, I wouldn't. But, but I think they're saying they'd like to d develop six, minimum of six candidates. And if there were an internal, maybe there would be seven. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no limit to how many. If they can find, they should deliver all the excellent candidates to us. Okay. My experience is in, in recruitment, it's not likely to have Ten great candidates. So I mean, we sh if we had six, that would be a lot, in my thought. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I wanna, can I, um, I, and I just really want to thank the support of the committee. There's been 15 people, and you know, that, as you know, that's a pretty big committee to work with. But everybody's been diligent about coming and participating and taking a part of it, and they've really been supportive of you know everything that we've done to this point. Um, the heavy lifting will start once we start getting the resumes and everything, yeah, but, tomorrow, right? but everybody's hung in there and I really want, you know, you take note that they've been a great committee so far. And Jane is here. Do you want to say anything about the process so far? And Jessica's here too. Jessica, oh, Jessica too. Here. Yeah. Oh. Let's see what can right. Um. Really prepared to say anything. You don't need to. And I would just say that I would echo what Kathy has said about it's been an incredibly supportive group. That all voices are valued, even though the level of expertise varies. And um, it's been um, it's been a great experience so far. We'll see what happens when the. I mean, there, there's been kind of a core group who have done a lot of the legwork, which I appreciate. Jessica. I would just echo, but also, so this, I'm Jessica Bremstead, and um, also I've been following a lot of it online and reading, and Anne has been tremendous to make sure that we're getting all the information, and the reason for that is that my mom has been very ill and just passed away this week, so I oh, I'm sorry. apologize I'm sorry. for not being as involved we're here sorry, or yeah. there, so I just noticed legislative update. Jessica, I gotta say, I love the photo in the paper. I thought that was you. Until I read the caption. Oh, really? yeah. That's nice. We're sorry Thanks. to hear that. Yeah. Our condolences. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Ugh. Well, we 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 have credited Anne on a number of occasions. I mean, she's done a, a fantastic job. On, I just want to say one more thing, Jerry. Um, we've met not a couple of times, but we yeah we've met a lot of times. And and the other thing. Um, people have asked me questions. Um, I think it was in the newspaper. But we're coming in under budget right now, so you should know that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We say that very quietly. <laughs> <laughs> At this time. At this time. <laughs> At this time.
Are there any questions? We will, uh, in a minute here, through a series of two motions, enter executive session uh, as the next item on our agenda to consider uh, the recommendation that the committee has just made of a contractor. Uh, I don't expect, given the question, that we will be terribly long, and we will be back, and we will uh, likely have uh, a, a decision uh, as we do. And I'd ask uh, Kathy, you and Roger to hang on in case after that process there are any other questions, and if those any of you who are uh, in the audience by then have another question, then please uh, take advantage of that timing. Do you have a prepared language for a motion? Uh, no, I don't. Do you want to take a stab? Right. I can do, yeah, I can try if, if this citation is correct. I'll assume it is. I move pursuant to 1 BSA 313A1A to find that premature public knowledge of the Municipal Resources, Inc. draft contract would clearly place the town at a substantial disadvantage. Thank you. Is there a second? Yes. Sir. Seconded by Mary. Any discussion? Any discussion in the public? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those disapproving, nay, the ayes have it. So are we inviting Kathy and Roger in? I to would the say so. Session? Uh, okay, I'll just I'll add that. I'll tack that on to the motion. I just wanted to confirm. Okay. And I'll second that amendment. Okay. Thank you. So I think we actually need a second motion. So yes. no amendment needed, but I'll okay. I'll start the second yeah. motion. Move to move pursuant to one BSA three thirteen A one A to enter executive session to discuss the draft Municipal Resources Inc. contract and invite Roger Price and Kathy Brooks to attend. So moved. Is there a second? Yes. Mary seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, those approving signify by saying aye, please. Aye. Aye. And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. We will be back, I, I think, in a reasonably short time. Yes. Executive session and resume the general session. So moved. Mary moves. And a second. Josh seconds. Somebody Any discussion? Any discussion in the public? Hearing none, those who approve signify please by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. We were now have resumed a general session. The next item is to consider signing a contract with Municipal Resources, Inc. for the town manager search process. Move to approve a professional services agreement between Municipal Resources, Inc. and the town of Shelburne, Vermont, dated July, what's today? The July 10th, 10. 2018. Thank you. And a second? So, second. Seconded by Mary. Any discussion? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. We thank you. Are there any other questions that someone might have thought about while we were out? Up? Do you have the original? To I was be going signed? to ask, can we get the contract to sign while we're over here? I, Maybe we could have Lee print it. Do you? Or you someone. Anne may have the original. I'm not sure. I don't have it. Will, <laughs> can I ask Lee? How much was the um, 16. 16,000. 16,000. Including two um, test profiles. Okay. Yeah, why don't you hit so we can get our, because if, if we, we just got need, use, We just okay. need the signature page. On. Yeah. Here we. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you have the original? No. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we can sign this. Yeah. Sign that. Yeah. Do you have a copy, Maddie? What? Yes, I can get a copy of that. You don't have a copy of the contract yet? No, I don't have a copy of the contract. And, Jerry? Excuse me. The survey is not final. So yeah. you can do as you like, but okay. it sh before it goes in print, we should find out. Yes. Okay. We're, we're very encouraging at that. The end looks great. We're all awake. 
Roger, what are you looking for in terms of finalizing the survey? Any comments from the board? No, or for just wanting Don Jutton at MRI to agree on the initial paragraph okay. wording. So it, it, it's his <coughs> survey, and Sorry. he's agreed to, to use phraseology that will enable it to sound like we're doing it with Understood. him. But I don't want to take the revisions that Kathy gave me and just tell him he has to use that. Okay. So I should know in the morning. Thanks, Thank you. Okay, the next item is a legislative update, and we're uh, honored to have with us Karen Horn, who uh, represents that expertise at the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Thank you, Karen, for coming. Thank you. Um, so I have a few um, copies of just sort of a crib sheet of um, Bills of concern to local officials that um, Great, thank you. Gonna actually have copies for anyone else that would like them. And um, we also have a few copies of our legislative wrap up, which is a booklet that we do at the end of the session. Um, I'm with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, I'm sorry. Um, backtrack a little bit. And direct, yeah. yeah. Pardon? Go near the microphones. Oh, certainly. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so we write a legislative wrap up at the end of every session, and we have a few extra <coughs> copies of that. I believe that the select board may have gotten them in the mail already, or or via email. Um, but if anybody would like one of those, um, you're welcome to it. Uh, and I just wanted to. I'm not. Don't panic. I'm not going to go through all these bills. <laughs> That's the first thing. Yes. And the second thing is that we wrote the legislative wrap up and decided we needed to get it out the door before the special session concluded. And uh, it, it actually turned out to be just a couple of days before the special session concluded, but you really didn't have any way of knowing it at that point in time. So, what it, so we're going to write an addendum that really includes just the um, education property tax legislation and short-term rental legislation that passed in the special session and that now requires uh, anybody who's, who's renting via Airbnb or um, vacation rental by owner or those kinds of uh, web-based platforms to register. There are not fees included at this point in time. The legislation had been worked on throughout the session, uh, didn't make it through the regular session, and then they passed it in the special session. So it is probably going to require at least a little bit of revision next year. But I imagine that in towns like Shelburne, you have a fair number of Airbnb type rentals, and it and it will be um, it may be relevant to to your town. The other, um, I just wanted to talk about a couple of bills, and there's a group of bills H five five four, H five seven six, H, um, and where's the other one? There are three uh, water quality bills. So one, and water quality is a huge issue here in uh, Chittenden County in particular, right along that lake. So one of the bills will require that the Agency of Natural Resources establish a permit for any property that has more than three acres of impervious surface. So rooftops, parking lots, and so forth. And a lot of municipal properties and school properties end up in that situation. They've just put out the stormwater rule that would implement that legislation. And we are in the process of reviewing it. I don't imagine that it's very different from something that was put out last October and then pulled back. But your uh, stormwater uh, folks have definitely looked at the earlier version. Chris uh, has, has been very involved in that conversation. H554 requires now the regulation of uh, the registration of all dams. So. 
interestingly, there's about a thousand dams in the state of Vermont. Quite a few of them, most of them, impound more than 500,000 gallons of water. Uh, but there are quite a few small ones, and there are quite a few small ones that belong to municipalities that actually municipalities aren't necessarily aware belong to them. So there, the Agency of Natural Resources is going to be doing some outreach around those smaller dams and uh, asking people to reg not just municipalities, but anybody that owns such a dam to, um, to register it. Uh, there is an exemption if you have a public water supply intake and that's the only purpose of the dam, but that's getting a little bit technical and I won't go into that. Um, but there is some consideration for those kinds of uh, facilities. And then um, the, where is that? Other? Oh, S260 is the bill that started out the legislation, it's on the back page, um, as a bill to establish a stormwater authority, some long-term funding source for stormwater and water quality related projects. That bill did not end up with anything like that kind of funding, which had really been our hope, or any kind of administrative um, parameters around what stormwater management might look like if it wasn't run by the Department of Environmental Conservation, Agriculture, Transportation, and any number of other agencies. So, that bill uh, does expand the makeup of the Clean Water Board, which is, has traditionally been only administration secretaries. And it includes now four members of the public. So if you have somebody with expertise in town who, in those kinds of issues, you might consider proposing that name to the governor. The governor is the one who will make those appointments. Uh, so if there's engineering expertise or, or Chris or somebody in Chittenden County that's interested in that, I think it would be very helpful to have a couple of people from the local level on that board making funding recommendations. The other thing that that bill does, because it turned into a total Christmas tree, is that it, uh, it provides for one year suspension of recycling of paper magazines, colored paper, white paper, newspapers. And that's because China has closed its markets to recyclables. And there's no market for paper or any number of other things, but uh, it seems that paper is what's backing up in warehouses more than anything else at this point in time. So that's very interesting, but, but the, it's highly likely that the agency, they, they had asked for it along with the Chittenden County Solid Waste District that they will suspend recycling of paper for at least that one year. There's a bunch of other stuff in that bill, but I'm, I'm not going to go into all of that. There are a couple of other bills that are of concern, I think, to municipalities. H-859, lease lands, is really sort of an arcane subject, but if... It, it's very much like ancient roads. So if your municipality has anything that looks like lease lands, which were originally granted uh, by Governor Benning Wentworth and part of the New Hampshire grants, so this is revolutionary um, times, and it's come, they've come down in municipal ownership, and, and before the uh, income tax and property taxes were put in place, you used to pay rents on those lands, and the rents went to support of the churches, which we aren't doing anymore, or schools, or uh, things like that, some occasionally doctors, homes. Um, so the Towns have owned these lands all this time, and in some cases, those lands are of no concern to the town anymore. In some cases, they are actually sites for rights of way for water lines and, and things like that. And in other cases, they turn out to be fairly desirable pieces of land, the top of Putley Mountain, and in Wilmington, the site of the heritage 
private ski area that's in bankruptcy now, if you ever read about that, are lease lands, so owned ultimately by the towns. This piece of legislation says that by January 1, 2020, unless you have voted to retain those lands, they are going to revert to the underlying property owner. So if somebody owns a, a house or something on those lands, and it's quite common that that has happened over time, uh, the property will revert to them unless the town takes action specifically to retain ownership. And if you do that, if you do take that action, you can later, after you've done an assessment of what you've got, essentially, you could, um, you know, allow for those towns to go to the underlying landowner. But it's something that we're really hoping that every town actually does take a look at. Um, and there are uh, records, they're old, they're handwritten, but there are records around, um, and if you're particularly interested in Leasland Historic Vermont geekiness, then there's a uh, presentation on Channel 17 from um, Paul Gillies, who, who sort of explains the whole history of it. So I just put that out there as well. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is that we did, as part of the municipal, uh, I'm sorry, as part of the state appropriations bill, eventually get tax rates, pro education property tax rates set for the state uh, just in the nick of time. I expect that uh, Shelburne has by now gotten its equalized education tax rates from the state. And so for the residential in Shelburne, the equalized education tax rate is $1.46461. And uh, the non-residential tax rate, which is consistent across the state, is $1.58. Both of those rates uh, went up in most towns. And that was the battle between the governor and the uh, legislature in the end. But uh, he, the governor allowed the budget to go into effect um, without his signature. You know, you've, you know all about that by now. So, and, and we, I, I don't know when you send out your bills, but there were a number of towns that traditionally send out their bills on July 2nd and were in complete panics about what are we gonna do? So, and let's see, what else? So, uh, I'll just mention um, recreational marijuana and then I, I think I'll, uh, if you've got questions about bills, I can answer them and if not, um, uh, that's fine as well. But the, the, the recreational marijuana um, legalizes the, the, own, the growing and ownership of um, four immature or two mature plants. I don't know what you do with the other two if you have a green thumb, but. Um, <laughs> right. And there's no provision for selling, so um, you can possess and you can grow. You can't sell. Business, places of business retain the authority to require that employees are not under the influence while at work or um, there, there's not a good uh, test for driving under the influence yet, but there is, you know, you're not going to be allowed to drive under the influence either. So, and there's no regulation of a commercial um, market at this point either at the local level or at the state level. So I, we imagine that we're going to have to come back and address those issues going forward. Uh, and that will be the discussion in the next legislative session. There is a uh, committee that's been working all of last year and this coming year as well on, right, on marijuana legalization and all the the components thereof and how it affects municipalities. Uh, can you regulate smoking in public parks? All those kinds of questions, zoning, next door neighbors, all that kind of stuff is sort of up in the air. Uh, Gwyn Zakov, who's works with me on, on legislative issues, is on one of those committees 
The police chief from Colchester was on one of their committees around uh, highway safety and marijuana, but she's retiring, so I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen with, with that seat. Hopefully we can get another law enforcement official from the local level on there. So that's another issue. And then um, I'll just mention that we uh, have policy committees that meet during the course of the summer, and we send out to all the local officials asking people to be a part of those policy committees. We've had two meetings already on finance and intergovernmental relations yesterday, um, which includes education funding and town clerk fees and all those kinds of things, finance issues. And then we had a quality of life and environment committee meeting last week water quality is tomorrow so if you have any concerns comments recommendations for us to include in a municipal policy platform in the next biennium it's going to be a two-year document now please let us know and we that's what we're there for we, we really want to be able to carry your voice to the legislature and uh, be accurate in our portrayal of what local government needs. So, and then, if I may, your representative is here, and I don't know if she has anything to add from her perspective. So, thank you. Are there thank questions? You, I was going to ask if maybe Representative Brumstead could just highlight the open meeting law changes, or maybe Karen could. Oh, yes. I've read a little I bit. I have no idea this was on yeah. the agenda. I, didn't, I don't want to misquote it. I have a general idea, but um, everything was iffy at the end. Okay. So how it passed the Senate was a little different. Gotcha. And then it went to conference, and I wasn't on the conference. No big deal. I um, but I, I would love the opportunity to talk about a lot of these these bills. I mean, lease lands was in my committee, and it was a really interesting um, discussion. And it was really because homeowners are having were having an impossible time selling their homes because they happened to be on top of leased lands, and they were having to pay all kinds of legal fees to um, be able to sell their home. And that's where it came from. We had a lot of people come in and complain, so that's why. Um, so do we have to, I mean, is there a process that we need to go through to evaluate this and who, where do we start that process? Well, um, there is, as I said, historical information about <clears throat> what lease lands are in um, various towns. It's not entirely accurate because, as you know, sur old surveys are like the stone at the corner of the farmhouse kind of thing. But it would give a general idea that um, of what, might be available. We're going to send out information about those kinds of materials. Um, it would. It's not a small job to undertake if you have lease lands to figure out exactly what you have and um, then make a decision about whether you want to uh, turn them over or not. Um, but there, you're, you would need to have somebody do research um, to sort of refine what's in the historical records there. Yeah, it's, so. a, it's a really interesting process. We all went through this some years back with what were called ancient roads. And part of the challenge is you can do all the research you want, but it's kind of like searching for a needle in a haystack, mm -hmm. except you don't even know mm -hmm. if the needle exists. So you don't know if you didn't find it, did it ever, was it ever there at all? Um, Charlotte's going to have an interesting time with Thompson's Point, although they have clear knowledge of all those leased lands, all those camps that the town owns uh -huh. the land under. But who knows what else might be out there. So, and what's the purpose of what drove that legislation in the first place? Well, as Representative Bromstead said, that it, it was basically um, people who have had difficulty selling Just properties because, because title insurers right. and mortgage holders have decided that you need to clear those title, those clouds up. And interestingly, it's mostly an issue in Chittenden County right now. It hasn't really reached the rest of the state yet. Oh. It will now, but um, yes. it, it hadn't before then. 
Well, there so was a lawsuit involving Malice Bay that went to the Supreme Court, yes. although that property was not owned yeah. by a municipality. It was privately owned, but there are a ton of camps that are on leased land. So yeah. in Mallet's Bay, the people on the leased land lost out because they didn't carry out some needed repairs. And the Vermont Supreme yeah. Court said, too bad, you snooze, you lose. Yeah. And I think that maybe, Jessica, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that went to the Supreme Court and it, people ended up having to leave their camps that they owned for generations because they're usually 99-year leases. Um, so I think yeah, that was probably the... It's a bit different Seed. here because the, these leases are as long as the grass grows and the sun shines or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Which might not be much longer, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> the, so, uh, and, and they're municipal, so it's right. not like... I, I haven't heard of an instance of a town like tossing somebody off. And I don't think that they would have that capacity anyway because it's a piece of the bundle of property rights. It's not all the property I'm rights. Just guessing that's what got yeah. the ball rolling because it was so yeah. controversial. There's a lot of there's a lot of those kinds of issues around. Wouldn't somebody in the town know if there's town owned leased land? Well we could certainly start with our assessor, but it's sometimes these things are go back so long in time and haven't been an issue so generations have come and gone and nobody really right. it would seem to me knew. that if the town wasn't aware of leased land that it owned that it wouldn't really care that much if it ended up not owning it longer unless right. of course it was became a piece of prized land to build a road on or Something like that. Yep. Or, or conserved land or something. Right. I mean, many towns will likely choose to just say, you're right, we don't know about it. It's never been an issue for the last hundred years. And just like with ancient roads, they may just say, we're not going to be concerned so about it. if you do nothing. And that's exactly yes. the issue. It was the key <laughs> before our committee was in Jericho. And the town was told by the um, title insurance folks you have to go and get a lawyer before you, and write something that says you're giving that land. And they were like, wait a minute, we don't have that much money. And now we have to, you know, pay money for a lawyer. And there's so much land like that. We could be spending lots of money if every, you know, title insurance is contested or every title is contested. It could cost us a lot. We want the legislature to fix this. And then we started looking into it and realizing as more and more people came into the committee that this was a real issue and most towns wanted no part of it. And I actually called Joe to see what he knew, our town manager, to see what he knew about it. And he knew a little because of Middlebury. And so um, he was going to look into it a bit more, but he wasn't concerned about the legislation. He thought that most of the leased land in Shelburne was more like churches, um, you know, our churches are on leased land, and most that's how it all started. One of the big ways that it started was um, churches, you know, towns wanting to allow churches to be there. Um, so, anyhow, I don't know what I could follow up actually with Joe and see if he ever did look into some of the. the Colleen might know as well. That's true. Yeah, so I could. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. So, um, on your pub open meeting question, um, the legislation defined the business of a public body um, as the governmental functions including any matter over which the public body has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. And then they said that if you're um, at an event, just at an event, and there's a quorum there, but you're not discussing town business, that that's not a meeting that you need to warn. Um, and, for instance, sometimes we have three or four um, select board members go to the select board forum that the Vermont League of Cities and Towns puts on, and you wouldn't need to warn that as a meeting. Uh, and then um, it defines prompt with respect to a records request. Um, which you already knew. Anyway, immediately with little or no delay and unless otherwise provided in this section not more than three business days from receipt of a request, you would need to respond to it. 
they did not make any changes around the five-day requirement for posting minutes or anything like that. So, well, Thank thanks, Karen. Thank, Thank you. you. Know we can now have a holiday party without yes. worrying about it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it <lies. laughs> Go to an awards ceremony. Go, go to a farmer's market. <laughs> yeah. Go to a little league game. Gee. You all were worried about which was then clarifying what is a serial meeting what ended up being taken out on the senate side and the house didn't come back in so because there was just so much um, concern about that point so thanks jessica thank you both we look forward to your return <laughs> shortly are there any questions in the public of karen Hearing none, the next item uh, on our agenda is the Library Town Center Project Update, which Ruth Egerman, Chair of the Library Board of Trustees, is going to present. Envelope. You can also take, if you're interested in the envelopes, it's a long library budget. update everyone on the town center and library project. Um, progress over the last six months has been pretty extensive, quite rapid, so we thought this was a good time to come in and tell you about what's been going on. So if you could move ahead. So I want to start just to remind you who all is involved. Uh, two years ago we hired Vermont Integrated Architecture, the town hired them, to um, be the architects of record. They are doing a great job for us. Um, we hired them for a lot of reasons, and one reason actually was because of their massive amount of experience, both in Vermont and in New York, with this kind of project where we are welding together an old building and a new building. Um, and they have a lot of awards and are on a lot of the lists from the Vermont State Historic Preservation Office. Um, so we have enjoyed working with them. Last summer, the town hired Negley and Chase to be the construction management. Again, the same reason, massive years of experience. Mark Negley's been in the business for 40 years. He did most of the work over at Shelburne Farms. And uh, before we hired them, we toured the VPR project, which was the same kind of thing, old brick building, melded to a brand new building. And I didn't know, even though I listened to VPR, I did not realize that they were working on that building the entire time they were broadcasting. They managed to get broadcasts out without little vibrations or thunks or anything. So. Um, those two companies have worked together as a team over the last year. I've been really impressed with how they're, they're just um, really clicking together and moving us right along. Uh, a couple months ago, the town hired Al Pietro, who is a uh, Shelburne uh, resident, to be the clerk of the works. So he is in charge of keeping track of, um, as the bills come in, he cross-checks to make sure the work was done and then pre presents the bills to the town. All right, now we do have a huge number of volunteers working on this project. Uh, in 2014, the steering committee for the project was put together. Since the bond passed, we have been meeting every Friday for at least two hours. And I don't think we've had a single Friday off, <laughs> um, unless you manage to get yourself out of town. So the steering committee consists of library trustees, uh, the library director, 
uh, the select board, a select board member, uh, the town manager, and then two members of the public, Alice Wynn, who most people know from her time on the select board previously, and then Ann Smallwood, who is a resident at Wake Robin. And I did want to say um, that the shift over in town manager position was a little confusing for us, but Lee has jumped in and already just been invaluable to us. He's saved us money, he's smoothed some troubled waters, he's really been great, so he's, he's good to work with. All right, so we then have, we realized that we had gotten ourselves into a very large project, so we split the large project out into groups um, or into separate tasks. The design group meets every Friday before the steering committee and it also meets for about two hours. The design group um, is composed of trustees, um, member of the public, the library director, and we meet with VIA. And we're doing, obviously, the, the questions of the design of the new space. And then we also do spend quite a bit of time talking about town hall. What does town hall need? How are we going to get it to where it needs to be? Um, we do have a separate fundraising group that is composed of many different representatives from town. There are many more people involved in fundraising than I've put up here. Uh, and they are having quite a bit of success. They've been reaching out in a lot of different ways and I have a separate slide for them. And then poor Kevin, the library director, is kind of hanging out down there all by himself as being the library temporary location coordinator. Um, this isn't really true. We're all helping him, but the coordination of the move is pretty complicated because it's not quite like moving your house. You're moving a lot of books, and you want them to end up at the new location in the correct order. Otherwise, we'll never be able to find anything. So he's been over there um, getting that organized. We worked with uh, Doug Nettie of Nettie Real Estate. We looked at three different properties in Shelburne and selected the field house as the best one for us. Um, now for fundraising, in the fall before the bond, um, a local family offered us a $500,000 challenge grant. And the terms of this grant are that they will match anything that we receive up to $500,000. Um, and all of that mon monies then will be put together to offset part of the bond, all right? So at this point, we are just a smidgen over halfway in fundraising for that. And so I believe that I can say with assurance that the bond draw would now be six million, not six and a half, because we do have those funds. We are not counting anything that's pledges. We're only counting cash. Peter has the cash. We know how much we have and we know what the match is. Did you have a question? Yeah. What, my understanding was you would only get the match if you raised 500. Okay, no, good. no, All right. no. All right. So um, we also have been receiving some great in-kind donations, and we would love more if you can think of anyone who can help us with in-kind donations. Um, all of the landscaping design for the project was donated. The moving of the plantings around the building uh, has been donated by the Garden Club. We worked with Doug Nettie. Teachers Trees came through and, and did a big tree survey with us at the very beginning. Um, and then RWO and Queen City Printers has done some publicity for us. So we're always looking for in-kind donations. I put down here that we have had some anonymous donations um, that have supported specifically the project branding, which is um, the logo and some of our, um, what our publicity looks like that you just got. Um, and the fundraising mailings. And I wanted to point that out because I want everybody to understand that we are fundraising, but we're doing it as inexpensively as we can because you know, we don't want to fundraise and then turn around and spend the fundraised money on more fundraising. Um, so now we are also um, always looking for any kind of donation. If none of those things attract your interest but you would still like to support the project, definitely contact one of us, um, talk to us about what you can do. All right, so um, now a project of this size, because it's for the town, has dragged in practically everybody over here in this building. So the town departments and committees, I want to point out first the town finance director, because we accidentally added a huge workload onto Peter. Um, he has to keep track of all the money that's coming in in the form of donations by putting it in a special pot. He is having to pay out the bills. He is having to answer all of our questions. And he is doing it the way he always does it, which is very politely and graciously and competently. And so we really owe Peter a lot. Um, and I think we're going to continue to owe Peter a lot. We have to take him out for a beer. Planning and zoning, of course, because this is a project that required permitting. We've um, been working a lot with Dean and his office. And they've also been very helpful and very gracious to us, because we've had a lot of questions. 
They came to us early in the spring and asked us to submit this project for permitting as a planned unit development in order to get the entire complex down here kind of reorganized and under one, um, I don't know, one set of paperwork. So um, we have done this. It's been an extensive process and um, did add to the workload of VIA because um, a lot of meetings were required and a lot of plans were put together that they hadn't actually anticipated for this process, but it's good. So for town departments, we had to get letters of support from different town departments, and we also, of course, wanted to know what they thought. So we've met frequently with the fire department, and this is important because obviously they are our closest neighbor, and they've got to be able to get in and out, and um, we do have to work closely with them to make sure that anything that we're doing is not going to interfere with them during construction, as well as with the product we end up. They have to be able to get their fire engines in and out of the parking lot. We've met with the police department, with RUC, with stormwater, buildings and grounds, water and wastewater, and the highway department. Um, that's kind of unusual, but that was because we wanted some advice on plowing, <laughs> okay? And I did want to point out that the highway department, so Paul has been, as per usual, great. Um, as we're moving, we've found that we needed some help over at the field house. He's built us a ramp. He's putting out street signs for us. I just discovered somebody's going to be having to paint some stripes in the parking lot, and I expect that'll be him. I don't think they'll let me do it. So um, Paul's been great. And then buildings and grounds, we've been working pretty closely with Darwin to um, find out the maintenance history of Town Hall because he's been here a long time, and he's been the person who's keeping it stuck together. So he's been a real wealth of information, particularly about Town Hall and what it might need, and he and Kyle are also helping orchestrate the move, so they've been good. Everybody's been great, but um, we've met a number of times with a tree warden who's kind of stuck down there on the bottom of the slide by himself because he doesn't fit in either of these categories, um, and I think we're going to continue to meet with the tree warden as we proceed through construction. We've also met with the relevant town committees. We've gone before the DRB four times. We did receive our permit um, final site approval May 16th. The HPDRC, Tree Advisory, Parks and Recs, Paths, Natural Resources, and Social Services. And I hope that I got everybody on the list. Yep. We've also gone out and met with local people who are not um, perhaps officially affiliated with the town, but that are important. And so this includes the Historical Society. We've met with them a number of times, and I'm sure we'll continue to do so. The school, the retirement communities, Rotary, the Little League, um, I could not find a parking place over here tonight because of the Little League. The Business and Professional Association, we also actually met with SCHIPS and I forgot to put them up there. And then uh, during the course of this pro process, we've met with the general public or we have made available to the general public 37 opportunities to meet with us in public forums as well as having a regular weekly warned meeting that people can come to. So. Next is public information during construction. So this is actually probably the most important slide for tonight. Um, about two or three weeks ago, Negley and Chase got together with the town manager, the police department, and the fire department, and they put together a construction communication plan because those three entities, well, I guess it's four with Negley and Chase, have to have a way to communicate with each other um, so that they always know what each other is doing. So they have come up with their plan and they've got each other's phone numbers. And I've put up here the two main guys who will be on site. Um, this is Rob Higgins who will be in and out of um, the process some. This right here is Pete Nelson and you will see Pete Nelson on site all of the time. He is the gonna be the go-to guy. And he does look just like that when you see him. He always has on dark glasses. All right, um, now if, just as with the wastewater this year, the town is putting out regular um, updates to tell us where traffic is gonna be bad. We are gonna have regular access updates, um, both through the Shelburne News and through Front Porch Forum. I put up here the Shelburne News um, has actually been really kind to us for publicity over the last six months. We've had been in the news six times um, in covered in articles and we're looking for that to continue, we're hoping. And then, um, as we go along, one of the things Nagley and Chase likes to do is to put out regular updates and photographs so that everybody can look and see, oh, look, the foundation has been poured, and this is what it looked like while it was being poured, and this is what it looks like now. And these are going to be available on the project website, which there's the address. You can get that address off the library Facebook page, the library web page, the um, town web page where the, the project has its own 
subdivision, and then also on the construction sign, actually out in the parking lot. Um, and if you can't find it, you can always just contact one of us and we'll, we'll send you the link. So I'm kind of looking forward to that website, actually. All right. So it's not up yet. The, 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 uh, go back one, please, Lee. Sorry. Yeah, that website is actually up. It's got okay. some information about fundraising and the history of the project. There aren't any progress updates and photos up yet because we haven't actually done anything to the site. <laughs> okay. Now, the timeline um, starts off really solid and then kind of fizzle, um, gets a little mushy towards the end here. But the library will close. Saturday this week is the last day the library will be open for roughly a week. So starting Monday, the library is going to move over to the field house. We are hoping that it will be open then for sort of a soft opening on the 21st. It will definitely be open the following Monday, the 23rd, okay? And then the 28th, we're going to be having a grand opening, and I was told there would be ice cream, so I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping that's true. <laughs> I'll do anything for ice cream. All right, on the 24th, um, Negley and Chase is planning to present to the select board the GMP, which is the guaranteed maximum price of construction. Um, assuming everything then is acceptable, they will actually begin on July 25th working on the site. Um, they have to get started switching over the power and the um, communication lines that right now run through the library and over to the fire department. They actually have to pull them back and just have a connection that feeds directly to the fire department. Um, so they need to get started on that before they can do really anything else. Um, in between that and the fire department practice, we are going to have a series of, of events where Town offices, um, the people who work here will come over and look around the building and see, hey, do I want that desk? And then Darwin and Kyle are going to come through and do the same thing. Hey, do we want those doorknobs? Um, the public, we're hoping to make anything that's left over that's useful available to the public at some point. I'm not sure how that's all going to work. We have to work out some of those details. And then at some time in mid-August, the fire department is going to come over and they're going to practice breaking through roofs using the library building so that um, they can practice their attic access techniques. So that should be exciting. Mm -hmm. and, and, <laughs> and, and we'll definitely let you know the date of that. I'm planning to come over and see if they'll let me have an axe. And then on the 13th-ish will be demolition. Um, and, but that's not quite scheduled yet because we're not sure how long some of this intervening stuff is going to take. Once demolition starts, we're on a 10-month construction schedule. And so if we stick to that 10 months, then we will be open by this time next year. So that will be pretty exciting. OK. All right, now I am not going to go through plans for anything because that takes forever. But anybody who wants to go through plans, um, we have, what do we have? We have landscaping plans, we have town hall plans, and we have new construction plans. And I will show those to anybody who wants. And I can talk about them for two or three hours, if you would like. Right, Lee? <laughs> Lee's like, oh, yeah. Get her started. She doesn't shut up. All right. Um, but this is mostly just to have it up here so that you get a rough idea that, so this is north up here, right? Uh, so here's Town Hall. There's going to be a vestibule just like there is today, only it will be much better, uh, larger. It will have some nice features. And then the new library will go um, kind of in a slight angle like this. It's a two-story construction, but it does, it will be just below the height of Town Hall. Um, and then there's uh, a part that comes out here. So I just want to point out a couple things that are going to be really great about this. For town center itself, we are ma managing to reorganize all the stormwater, um, which is something the stormwater department really wanted. There's going to be a, I don't know what you call it. It's not really a rain garden, but it's some kind of stormwater um, collections, or, or I don't know. I'm sure there's technical term for it, but it's going to be right over here. Um, we are widening the entry at Route 7. We are not moving it. And they, um, there was a lot of discussion about moving it, and the fire department said, no, 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 we really like where it is, but we are widening it, so there will be two lanes out, so we can all now turn left and right. <laughs> Perfect, right? Um, another thing that was real important to a lot of people in town was, so there's going to be an um, entrance right here, just the way there is now, and if, you, if we had everything on here, the rotary park would be like right over here, okay? There's going to be a crosswalk and then a concrete, or it's not a concrete, but a, a curbed garden set kind of right in the middle of this to encourage pedestrians to stop wandering around the parking lot with their cell phone like I do and to actually just walk right across this parking lot and enter the Rotary Park safely. Um, and that has involved a lot of going out with pylons and driving fire trucks around and stuff. Um, 
So there are a lot of other town center site improvements that we could talk about if you wanted. The town hall, again, town hall is gonna receive a lot of work. A lot of that's actually gonna be at the end. It's maybe not gonna be quite so visible because a lot of what town hall really needs is some um, sort of maintenance and reconstruction to things you can't quite see. But the front porch, the concrete has completely failed on the porch and so we will be taking, holding up the portico somehow um, and, you know, the roof structure and then pulling out the concrete and replacing all that concrete and resurfacing it because it's, it's really pretty sad under there. Um, as you know, when you go in the town hall, if you look up on the balcony, the, the ceiling has a huge amount of water damage down at that one end and that is because the flashing around the cupola failed a number of years ago. So we will fix the cupola flashing, work on the cupola and then come back inside and clean that all up and replaster it professionally and, and repaint and make it look all new again. And then another real highlight I think for some people is that the Historical Society has been in communication with the town about using some of the basement space for storage for their meetings. Um, and that I think is gonna be a really great use of, of that space, so. And then for the new library space, all of this over here, um, there's a whole bunch of different things on our list, but I do wanna point out it will be a net zero construction. We're doing our best to reduce um, energy bills for the town. There are gonna be three public restrooms instead of the one that we currently have, two meeting rooms instead of the one we currently have. Plus back here, this yellow square is the community, it's gonna be a community meeting room um, that will be open to people. Even if the library is not open, we will be able to make it available to people. And you can see it's kind of in between town hall and a meeting room in size. Um, so we're forcing a lot of different functions in there. And then the highlight to many people is in the vestibule will be a full service, properly sized elevator. <laughs> <laughs> that everybody can use without having to stop and talk to anybody at the front desk. So um, we're very excited about that elevator. All right, so I, I can, like I said, I can talk more about the library, but um, it's probably better if you just come see me. And then we have one last slide that I don't know if it's gonna work or not. Lee's a little skeptical about this. So click on, just click on it. Sort of double click. There it goes, okay, now wait for seven minutes. Now this is a rendering, so there's gonna be, maybe you should click again. It should start loading up. Oh, come on. There it goes. There it goes. So the landscaping on this really isn't right, okay? So, so um, there's going to be a lot more landscaping. But this is one of those really cool go around the building and look at how cool it is. So there's Town Hall. This is going to be the vestibule with the elevator. And here's that first entrance. Um, nice big southern window openings. This is the west side, the railroad side. There's another entrance there. Um, children are on this floor. Adults are on this floor. This then is the, uh, well, this is the north side. This is the side that faces Marcotte. There's a lot of mechanicals here. These are all the trees that are currently there. Uh, this is the community room that I pointed out. There's gonna be a lot of landscaping right here that we didn't bother to draw in. And then you come around to the front again of Town Hall. So that's what it's gonna look like. All right, so anybody have any questions? I just wanna commend you on our the new parking entrance and all that mm -hmm. I, I know i was on the drb when this plan first came in and i know that my colleagues and i really struggled with the original plan which um, called the little island that was uh originally um, called for uh, a, a a refuge and mm -hmm. my mind having a refuge <laughs> in the middle of a parking lot sounded scary uh, and so what you've come up with here is really i think uh fantastic and so pleased because I mm -hmm. know it was a struggle to try to fit all of the moving pieces together with the new fire truck which has its issues because mm -hmm. it can't go through the fire department so I, I really want to commend whoever worked on getting mm -hmm. that piece yeah. done because it was yeah, a real concern. A lot of people did and, yeah. and you know it's one of those things where you get a lot of comments and things get better so. Right and so uh, Kudos Thank to you. all of you. I, I can't, uh, you know, I, I would love to know the hours. <laughs> no, 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 no. We're not keeping track of the hours. We're this by volunteers <laughs> no. in our community. I mean, aren't we so lucky? Yeah. Oh, that's so, probably yeah. pretty incredible. Yeah, it really is. So thank you so much. No, you're welcome. We're having Josh. a good time. <laughs> Josh, you got any comments? No, it's fine. Thanks, Ruth. Please okay. thank Kathy mm -hmm. all, right. for all of us as oh, well. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>
clarify something that you said, and I may, oh, uh, okay. if it's okay, approach you. Sure. Okay. Um, and I hope this doesn't sound defensive because it's not meant in that way at all. Some of you know that planning for this campus has been going on for a number of years. Um, as part of a study that was done around uh, 2010, I believe, when we were looking at the possibility of rebuilding the library and the fire department, uh, the fire station, um, there was recognition that if there was going to be significant development on the site, th there would have to be done through a plan unit development approach. It's really the only reasonable way that a project like this could be reviewed and approved successfully on a site like this. So I just wanted to make it clear that um, there wasn't any decision made on the part of the planning and zoning department to impose a PUD requirement. It was understood going back many, many years that the PUD was the vehicle to yeah. be used to have it reviewed. Yeah. And I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that's my fault, my ignorance. Um, and also, I wasn't at the meeting with him. So, <laughs> But whatever, it all worked out great. OK, so this is your point. Thank you so much Excellent. for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your time. I've got uh, root beef. Oh, sorry. So all the extra hours you need are just putting in. Yeah, Doris, Doris, microphone. You should. <laughs> I have to ask. Doris Sage, all these extra hours that Peter is putting in, is that all volunteer? That Peter is putting in? Yeah. No, those are not. Good. I mean, the town <laughs> borrowed the money. Oh, okay. Good. And we are expending Good. against it. That's uh, that's just a sim uh, an yeah. integral function of town finance. And, that's yeah. fair. Thanks, Doris. Yeah. I had a couple of of proposals that I wanted to make all right. to all of you. Uh, this is based on my participation in Lee's over a period of, I don't know, maybe a month or five weeks, whatever, uh, which has been uh, uh, an, a, a matter of great learning and, uh, and uh, the development of uh, some super respect for what these volunteers are doing. And in that case, I've got uh, a couple of things I'm proposing to us which are really in the way of tidying up a bit. Uh, the first involves uh, Lee's role. As all of us know, it was a contract condition of his that he not participate as a full voting member of the steering committee because of his uh, because it might be perceived that he was biased toward the fire department. Uh, I'm proposing that we relieve him of that condition, that we in effect withdraw it. It turns out, in my mind, to be unworkable. Uh, he is the town manager, and uh, there is simply no way that he can distance himself from uh, from uh, not only information but decisions, nor should his voice not be uh, 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 counted in the in the deliberations of the steering committee itself. So I'm proposing tonight that we relieve that condition uh, on his par on on uh, at, at, on our parts. Uh, it's also the case that when as the committee was set up four years ago. Uh, it's, it has evolved over time in step with actual development of the new library and town center project into a project manager responsible for the design and construction detail of a multi-million dollar project in oversight of architect, engineer, and construction contractors. This is a remarkable responsibility, largely on the part of volunteers. Uh, about which you really can't say enough, uh, even at this stage, uh, is being carried out with economy and unusual vision and deserves our active support as well as our very great thanks. Uh, I'd like to propose as well that we, by their request, formalize the name of the committee, which will henceforth, if you're so willing, be the new library and town center project construction committee uh, and uh, as, has, as one of you, I think, has already pointed out to me, hopefully we have a shorter bunch of capital letters than that. So maybe CC will, will uh, it's, 
it's useful to think ahead that the evolution of this committee over four years will continue because there is a, a, an, an extensive and important period of, of operations and maintenance, which in its, certainly it's in, in, in its initial stages and perhaps in its continuing uh, experience is going to require the same kind of, of, of uh, innovation and, and uh, uh, commitment and oversight. And I would see uh, that the committee has a future life beyond simply construction and, and the opening. Uh, lastly, it's, it, I think it's useful at this point for us to formalize committee membership. And this, the committee itself has recommended uh, seven to include the chair of the trustees, the librarian, the town manager, representation of the select board, two public mem members, and a second representative of the trustees. Uh, in our case, uh, Colleen Parker represents the select board. If we're so willing tonight, ta uh, uh, Lee would become the, the town manager representative. And uh, I certainly am highly confident, uh, having shared the work with him for these number of weeks, that he's more than capable in, in uh, bearing that load. So these are three ideas I'd like you to consider, if you're so willing. The committee will return in two weeks, at which point it will have substantial information about, uh, of a financial kind, because the, the bids will be in hand and we'll get a pretty thorough understanding of where things stand in terms of expected costs and, and at this point, uh, anticipated costs. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, probably the advantage, too, of a, a little more technical review of the construction project itself. Uh, I'm, I'm going to close by saying this experience of mine has been one of the most impressive in my municipal career. And that comes from having once struggled to put an elevator in a 1904 Carnegie Library, which was all stone. So that comes, that comes not only from the heart, but that comes from, from some creases in the face from, from all that experience. But I will tell you, for volunteers in this town, folks just like us who have spent un unimaginable hours, thousands of hours, I'm sure. This is a, a really extraordinary, uh, a, a extraordinary accomplishment, and I don't know how you can be thanked enough. So if my colleagues are so willing, I'm proposing that we, we name it formally now as the new Library and Town Center Project Construction Committee, that we formalize its membership at seven, as, as described and that we relieve Lee of the requirement that he spectate but not participate, and uh, which I again think is in the town's interest. Is that a motion? We well, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm generally uh, fine with this, but I do have a concern um, with the committee membership. And as you've stated, if uh, Colleen has been um, the select board contact for this um, for quite some time, but as you've stated, um, she hasn't uh, attended any of the meetings in almost a year. And so if we want to have select board representation, I think we have to have representation of someone who actually goes to the meetings. And so I'm not sure what the solution is, but it is a concern if that is one of the um, membership slots, then it needs to be filled by someone who's going to attend the meetings. Uh, we're only calling here to speak for herself. I can say that, that um, uh, uh, largely it's been the case that she's not been able to attend meetings. There have been a number of reasons for that. Uh, initially, uh, that was apparently a recommendation of the former town manager uh, that her uh, presence was not uh, required. Uh, in more recent times, uh, uh, Colleen simply has had uh, obligations such that 
morning meetings and the frequency of them were not uh, were, were, were not possible for her to attend. Uh, I, th I think she well understands that the board, without that communication directly, is at a handicap in terms of issues such as uh, what our policy is going to be on change orders, for instance, that we'll discuss at the next meeting. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I wish Colleen were here tonight because I know she's terribly dedicated to this project has been involved in the initial steering committee when it was an investigatory body, and uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's probably just too bad that at a point in time where participation is really critical in, in, in these stages of bidding and construction starts and whatnot, uh, that, uh, uh, but, but she's not here. So do we need to defer appointments until? I mean, we really need to appoint people. If no, we're, if we're I, I, reforming, I think we can the committee, right? I, I don't I, know who the two public members are. It's Anne. Yeah, right? Anne Smallwood, Smallwood and, and uh, Alice. Alice. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's a functioning body. We're really just formalizing it. Uh, uh, no, I don't think. Uh, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Well, I, I think, uh, here's my suggestion, Josh. I don't think that it's right or, or appropriate to, in essence, uh, remove somebody from a standing committee. And so all we're doing is renaming it. Um, so um, it might be worth perhaps chatting about it at another time, but I, I wouldn't think that this would be the time to consider that particular issue. I think the more, more of, uh, uh, the chair's comments are aimed at renaming the committee, and in that regard, I would suggest dropping the name project because um, it would just shorten it a little bit. <laughs> um, and then also to allow Lee to participate more. So, well, I, I guess I, I still have that concern in that um, if we are creating a new committee and appointing. Well, that's. I don't that, think we are. Maybe well, I'm wrong it, about it, that. It, I, I agree. I don't think we're creating a new committee. I think we're okay. renaming a committee. Well, and then I, trying to determine appointment. Well, I mean, it it it, it will certainly come to um, up uh, when in our next item, if we talk about the committees, where currently there's a um, a section in there that says that we expect. Uh, attendance at meetings at 75 percent. There's no question about that, but that, that's, I think the point I'm trying to make is that that's not germane for this discussion right now, because all we're doing is renaming the committee. I think right now it's called the Library Committee or something along those lines, and, and there's some um, feeling that that's just to narrow uh, a look at what's actually happening on the ground, because there's town hall and there's improvements to the curtilage that uh, impacts this whole campus, and then also for Lee. Am I wrong about that? Is my interpretation wrong? And, and I think all of those are, I, I, I have no problem with that at all. I'm just, I do have concern about if we are um, expecting that we have a contact with the committee that is going to, you know, give us information, how is that going to happen? And uh, so... I'd be comfortable authorizing the chair to finalize whoever is the appropriate representative to that committee, and then the board can ratify it at a future date, right? I think we should leave it up to you. To, yeah, I, th I think our first step, that. this is a, a, so, will, so will the committee be back, and as a first step, perhaps, uh, uh, I think it's important that we formalize just in its outline and maybe we can pen the appointments for a discussion next time. I certainly would much prefer that Colleen be here. Uh, I think everybody agrees and understands from, from Ruth's presentation that, that uh, there, is, uh, there are construction uh, meetings weekly now on Tuesdays. There are continuing design meetings. Uh, we, we sometimes don't refer enough to the fundraising, which is also going on. This is not just 
the project. It's pretty, pretty incredible. But most importantly, I think we've we've lacked as a board the the understandings and and regular communication of what what how the project was progressing. And I think at this point, I'm much more confident, having enjoyed their presence and uh, been made aware of just how communicative they're more than willing to be. Uh, and if we formalize, uh, change Lee's role, then I'd be confident that at the moment, when it's very critical at this handoff from architect, engineer to constructor, and then actual construction starts, uh, that we're that we're in the uh, uh, you know that we're uh, being provided regular information as we go along. That helps Peter. That certainly helps Kevin, who is someone about whom also I can't say enough. Or the librarian. Uh, so if the if you were so willing that we change the name, I'm not sure about taking project out. But. Uh, there's so many names in there, why not? I mean, why not have, yeah. I, I think we talked about that at the last meeting, and I think we thought maybe just leave project out. Okay. I mean, so know, it will be new library and town center construction committee. committee. Yeah. And as you say, it's going to go past construction. Do you need construction well, there? Well, we'll probably come back and <laughs> we'll probably get tired of trying to find uh, NLTCCC anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I yeah. just want to make sure that I'm not wrong in what is happening right now, because maybe I miss, with all the comments, maybe I misinterpreted. Really what we're doing is we're renaming an existing ad hoc committee. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Right. And which and which four, years, adding, four, adding. four years ago was launched with yeah. a different purpose and, Understood. and, and Understood. has never really been. And we're adding yeah. Lee right. as a voting member, or at least we're... Right. That's the suggestion. Correct. Modified Lee's contract. We're setting right. up the composition so and then we're modifying that. the contract so Lee can be a full participating is that member. A motion? Yeah. Is that a motion? That would be super as a motion. And I would second it if it were. Why, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> is there further discussion? Any discussion in the public? Hearing none, those approving, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. The eyes have it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. We look forward to two weeks from now. Yeah. No. Oh. Next item on the agenda. T triple C, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Next item on the agenda is the CBC application process, which to which I'm going to for for the lead of which I'm going to turn to Mary. Oh, not fair. <laughs> and there are copies of the documents on the table. There's six or eight copies if anyone's interested in seeing either the proposed updated application form or the policy itself. <clears throat> Not a word. Okay. So, um, and we're all coming from the same 7, 10, 18 uh, update. Yep. Yeah. It should have both green and yellow on it. So just by way of background for all our interested uh, uh, audience and at-home viewers, this is a continuing effort to establish a rule for the uh, application and qualification process for folks to come on as members of our beloved uh, commissions, committees, and boards. Uh, this process got started um, Actually, even before I was on the board and when uh, Jamie was still a commissioner, uh, when there was some thought to trying to standardize this process, um, the prior town manager shared with uh, myself and with Jamie the Heinsberg rule, which I freely and willingly purloined to start the process of drafting. It has now morphed to be a little bit more Manchester-y, vermont -y, and has also gotten the seal of approval from our resident Yaley here. And so now I think we're about ready to roll with this. There were, there were provisions uh, that are highlighted by Lee just for ease of reference. Um, and also with his comments, uh, right? And but other than that, I think uh, we're very, very close. So, uh, with your indulgence, uh, I'd like to just walk through the highlights. 
Uh, and then if people have other issues with the rule, we can address those. Is that okay if we proceed that way? So the first highlight is um, subsection B, application procedures. Um, and Lee highlighted it. Is this really necessary? I, this is, um, I think, and, and Jerry, you'll have to respond to this, I think, because this was your ad. I think this was the procedures for appointment just to ad hoc pro tem and other impermanent committees. So it's just, I think it's really clarifying that if, I think your intention is that if you're going to become a member of an ad hoc committee, for example, that we decide to form on the spot, we're not going to, we're going to make folks go through this same procedure. Right, and the reason for the question was in item 14 just above it, it actually already references ad hoc committees. So it was more a question of our, do we need to repeat that or should right. we just include it above and make number 14 say ad hoc committees, pro tem and other impermanent committees and just include it in the list. I would do that. Rather than a easier. separate so section. this wouldn't apply to subcommittees, right? CBC? No. Right. Because those are formed by the, right. by the committee. Okay. Right. CBC. Right. No. I think the confusion here, Lee, is that somehow uh, 14 got got added to that list and turned out to be repetitive. Originally, it wasn't there. Um, if if would it be clearer just tossing it out if we eliminated 14 and renamed yeah. them underneath? Yeah. Uh, because there's a point where it says. I agree with so, Lee, actually. Do we want, I guess I would ask for the board's input, do we want a pro tem committee, the ethics committee comes to mind as having to go through this process when that's only formed I, I, in a time sensitive matter, right? There's, I, I, I there's some agree. urgency to that, that, and going through this process is we not We wouldn't want to fast. go through this, sorry. No, it's okay. I still think there has to be a, 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 Giving your, your example, there has to be a better process than there was last time. And so I think there has to be, even if that has a, if, if, if it's a streamlined process, that would seem reasonable. Um, but um, I think that um, there needs to be some procedure um, documented that, we, that would be in place. Because if you say they don't have to go through it, then what do we have? Yeah. I mean, my sense was that all appointments should be conducted in a similar way as possible. With, with, with pro tem, some of the things are not possible. There's no possibility of getting a chair recommendation because there's no, no elected chairperson. Right. Yeah, right. And so as long as there's another process. Yeah, and no doubt we would be able to, to modify the process according but to. But you're not going to make those individuals fill out an application, right, for a pro tem ethics committee? Maybe. Why well, not? I do we want to do that? It depends on the committee. Okay. Well, well but that's I mean, the problem. We can't, we can't have a rule that, that standardized and then say it depends on the committee. Well, I, so, I guess, well, I guess I didn't quite mean that. Yes, I do think so. Uh, and let's return to the pro tem committee, which was launched as a complete body without sub substantiation of background or interest or willingness. Uh, I mean, Thank, thank the Lord for, for mm -hmm. our fellow volunteers. It all worked out fine. But I think the point is, uh, why wouldn't we, unless time was of such a, 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 a factor, which conceivably could be the case, and it's a policy that we could, we could ourselves modify in some extraordinary circumstance like that, but why would we not have uh, elements of the same appointment process uh, applied to uh, tem impermanent bodies as we do. I'm good with that. I just asked, is that yeah. what we mean when we say yeah. all committees have to go through this yeah. process? That's fine. I, I, I think it's, um, you know, I thought about it and it, it could be, a, there can be circumstances when we need to move quickly and the one that came to mind was the committee, the search committee for their town manager. The Great. way that worked, I thought it, you, I thought it was handled quite nicely where we, 
each got to select some people. Um, I suppose we, we each got people, we, and it worked, and, and we just had a report this evening and how, uh, how well the committee is working together. Yeah. And, um, I, I don't, and we did it in, what, two meetings? You know, would that be possible if at each person had to first apply? Right, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I... And by the way, I've been um, very lucky that, uh, thanks to my husband, I've actually been able to listen to the meeting since 7.50. So I heard oh, all the discussion about the library and, the, and some concerns that we can address at future meetings. Um, but as far as this is concerned, what if you had an exception uh, that this didn't apply if um, if the intended tenure of the committee was less than a certain amount of time. Like, the, t you know, for example, you uh, mentioned the pro temp ethics committee. You know, it was expected that um, the duration of that committee's time would be less than a few months. So if you said, well, if the tenure of the committee is less than six months, this application process doesn't apply. Or, or less than a year and or something. In exigent circumstances that the rules could be suspended for the appointment of a committee? See, in my mind, at that point, a pro tem would, would, would uh, uh, evolve into a standing committee. I mean, if you had a, a need for a pro tem in excess of six months or anticipated, uh, and, I th the, and the other problem I think there is you don't know what the duration is going to be. Uh, I, I'd be content if we uh, if, as, if it's a matter of policy, <clears throat> we applied as, as much of the procedures as, as were uh, workable to any appointment to any body temporary or standing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so that's, that if, that's we, my if we had this in place, we couldn't have followed the process we did on the search committee, yes, right. which we all agree worked pretty well, right, with each board member soliciting interest on his or her own behalf, right? No, because we didn't, we didn't, uh, we didn't ask for uh, written, we didn't ask for information, we didn't ask for willingness. No, we didn't. No. I mean, I, 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 I guess I'm, I'm struck by the fact that it shouldn't be that difficult to for people to if to fill out the application. I mean, it can't take very long, and since we're going to have to go through a process of um, assessing um, who want, who is going to be in the committee, I don't see that as being a really difficult thing. I mean, I can see a lot of the other time frames and all of that probably are not. Right. relevant um, and so I think inserting a a, uh, a, a, a a point that says that um, as it was stated that the, the select board can make modifications in extreme you know uh, this? I think I know where you're coming from what if we said for ad hoc mm -hmm. pro tem and impermanent committees the board will follow this r r rule to the extent practicable. Within the and time, may, within the time, yeah. within the time. <laughs> and may modify it to exempt well, I appointments to those. Oh. Oh, we didn't go that oh, all right. Yeah. Okay. By as much of the process as practicable oh. for ad hoc. Fantastic. Thank you, Mary. That's great. Okay. Someone's going to need to email this to me in Word. I will do that. Thank you. I, the next item is uh, exempt CBCs, and Lee has a comment. Do we need any if we're going to delineate uh, in the first part of subdivision A all, all of the committees that it applies to, and then also have a section on ad hocs? Can we eliminate exempt CBCs? I would vote for eliminating it on the theory that a simpler rule is a better rule. Okay. Josh? Yeah. Good. So you're, you think just to cross out all of C? Yes. Okay. 
because what we've done in the first part of the rule is mm -hmm. uh, uh, name all the committees exempt. and then we have a provision for ad hoc pro tem, et cetera. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then the next change is in uh, subdivision small Roman numeral two subparagraph, well, A2, so subparagraph two, good standing shall mean. Um, there was talk between myself and Jerry about uh, attendance records uh, first being eight, a minimum of 80% attendance, but also could be set by the, the individual CBC. I don't think it's necessary to hand that off to the individual CBC if we're going to call for a fairly high attendance record. Um, and then Lee's comment th was that he thought 75% for volunteers was a pretty good record and that there should be some, um, you know, it, that, you, that not counting personal or professional reasons. And I, I just want to say uh, and uh, that on, on my CBC, on the DRB, we've had, an, had a number of people who couldn't serve regularly for one reason or another. We had one who was commuting to Bennington for work. Uh, we had another, uh, Jeff Hodgson, who, whose profession is taking him as, as pretty far and wide in New York and Connecticut. Um, and these people show up after, you know, many times after driving three hours to get to a meeting on time, and they're working hard, as we all know. And, and I feel like we're going to scare a lot of people away if we come out of the gate saying, you know, it's, you're not in good standing if you don't make 80% of the meetings. We had one member who had to have surgery because of bad knees, but we loved having her. And we have um, wonderful alternates who would always come to the meetings. Jamie, I don't, you know, what was your experience on the commission? I agree. Yeah, no, I mean, if we had... We, all the boards have good people on them, so this is normally never an issue. And yeah. I agree with you. I think you can, the chair can manage things offline if needed with right. members who don't attend as yeah. frequently as needed. So I can live with It's a good target. Yeah. It's a good benchmark. Right, but I like the clause that for personal or professional reasons. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I do have a question on A1, though. Are we, are we really going to do this for... We're going to seek feed feedback, or is this through staff? The select board shall seek feedback from the chair, other A1. CBC members, A1. and staff for each appointment to every committee. We're going to go out and go through this process. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot of people. Yeah, you know, the answer is, for me, yes. For you, yes. Yeah. Okay. And I think that we'll get to the comment that Mary and I have discussed. Doing that. I mean, like when reappointments come up, I mean, there is, you know, just a, an, you know, an asking of the committee in general, um, you know, how's this person working out? And, uh, and they're usually pretty quick to say, we're really grateful for the volunteer and we don't want them to go anywhere. Yeah. I thought you made a really good ad there, Mary, unless otherwise excused. And it appears in several other places, too. That was yeah. me. Yeah. I, <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I thought that's a great ad. Yeah. You know, speaking from experience where I've worked with many board members who were, as Mary had suggested and Jamie, great board members, but couldn't make all the meetings. But when yeah. they were there, they were highly productive, and you'd hate to kick everybody off who can't always make every meeting. Yeah. There is one other change above on this page that I didn't highlight, and that's under D, eligibility for appointment. And there's one that would have been number four if I could have made word behave. Um, Ann and I suggest this one to allow an authorized representative of a business or landowner in Shelburne. And the reason for that is we have, for example, two very good members on the Stormwater Advisory Committee. They're not residents of Shelburne. They don't own businesses, but they're representing large landowners, and they've been very helpful and productive. Excellent, is that just a matter of putting a, a Roman numeral 1V there? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, it, it, Jamie, are you are, are you okay with A one then after I'm the discussion? It. Okay, long, great. As long as we do it, I'm good with that. I right. thought that the students. 
I'm sorry. I'm trying to, uh, you know what, no, I was just thinking like the high school students that we've had, most of them have been from CVU, but I thought initially we expanded that, that it was also, you know, I guess it would still apply because it would be a family of a resident of Shelburne. Okay. I withdraw my comment. Uh, can we move to uh, yes. 2A2? Good standing shall mean a serving member contributes to CBC goals and effective operation maintains an annual attendance level of at least 75% at meetings unless otherwise excused for, can we say, can we drop the word demonstrated? I mean, yeah. per, I mean sure. for personal or professional reasons? I don't think it's a case of submitting a doctor's, doctor's slip. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, and conducts her or himself throughout CBC activity in a respectful, collaborative manner. Uh, Lee is telling us that it's a little bit of a risky concept outside of more objective criteria such as attendance. I, st I still think it's okay because I think someone should understand that they're there to contribute productively. I think there have been one or two occasions in the past on CBCs where there are where members that were, were not productive in the sense that they were cooperative and respectful. Is that okay? Is everyone, is everyone okay? Okay. Yep. So it's going to stay in. All right. Uh, let's see, what page are we on now? There we go. The next is uh, 3B. No, three, nope, sorry, it's Roman four. I think we're, I think I'm going to work on renumbering these a little yeah, better. Not, 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 um, not your fault, I think it's Heinsberg's. No, it's, it's just that this thing has gone through Word, email, Word, PDF. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Plus those small case Roman numerals are, are hard to deal with on an iPhone, I can tell you. Is that what you've been <laughs> yeah. typing me on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder. You okay. keep getting you keep getting L's <laughs> for eyes. <laughs> uh, okay, so the next is Roman oh, numeral. Yeah. It's uh, Roman numeral four application and interview process. Uh, so uh, I frankly don't understand your comment, Lee. So in reading the document in its entirety, it, it, it appears that reappointment would be more likely than not, assuming someone's been a, a good member, and there may be good reason for that. Other communities tend to welcome somebody's reapplying, but they go through the same interview process again. And, and so I'm just asking the question, if you intend for reappointment to take precedence, because it's sort of structured in a way that if I want to reapply, I'm going to get my seat and no one else need to try. So I'm just asking the question, is that really, if it is yeah, your... Why, why do you what makes you think that? No. Where do you come up with precedence? Um, if you read below, and B? in A, B, and C, prior to advertising a position, the town manager will contact those who may be up for reappointment. Right. And then C, you'll, re you'll review reappointments and consider them and then D, vacancies remaining after reappointment will be advertised. Mm -hmm. So again, I, I have no judgment attached. Right. I'm just asking, is it your intent to presume that reappointment comes first before you advertise a position being oh, open oh, to the community oh, at large? You, now I understand what so you're saying. So this is really saying, well, if I, I want to be reappointed, would. I get my yeah. first crack at that before we advertise. Well, I would think if we that's would. the approach, yeah. by all means, yeah. I'm just well, asking the question. Oh, okay. This is Title, right? So can't we just say Roman numeral for reappointment application and interview process? <clears throat> sure. But isn't the point is that if it's the person would like to stay on the committee, do they really need to go through that entire process of filling out an application and no. interviewing again? No, they have to do A, B, and C. So prior to advertising, town manager calls me and really says, no okay. hey, and do you want to be on? And then I say, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, oh, I, I guess yeah. we're supposed to notify the chairperson and the select board no, ma no later than a certain date. And then we review it first and consider the reappointment and then just reappoint. But if there is not, if the person doesn't want 
to be reappointed or if the person isn't reappointed, then you go to steps D, E, F, and so I think forth. this is where we had the issue in the past with not having a closed loop of feedback from the committee chairs right. on some of the reappointments that just went through on a, right. a slate. That right, exactly. Right? Yep. I think um, we need to somehow address that, right? At least give the chairs an opportunity to get involved in this process. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, and later Josh makes a point about uh, both the chair and the board being notified at the same time. Right. Uh, I think that's very important. I think well, that's, there's H. Yeah. So can we, yeah. can we say for H, before voting on uh, well, reappointment or application, like stick, push it in there so that we know that for any reappointment, we're going to seek feedback from the chairperson or the next in line. Well, right? in B, we have the notification. Uh, so what the, the thread here would be having notified the chair is getting the, the recommendation from the chair. And my sense of Josh, Josh's comment was we didn't really specify that later on in the process. Mm -hmm. So well, we, we shouldn't assume it. Right. You know. But we do in H. So we yep, say before exactly. voting, the select board shall seek and consider feedback yep. from Pete, the chair. Yeah. B, B doesn't work well in practice. No. Committee members don't know their terms. They're not going to give it adequate notice right. okay. to the chair. So that has to be yep. administration that manages that. Um, It'll just be a mess. So I like the two, what the two of you came up with. Is a, that was you know, sheer Josh. The green. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to weave the green into H, Josh, that I think, sense. or make it F. Upon receiving application, the town manager will forward it to the appropriate... I think unless yeah, yeah it may I think, it may, help, it may fit earlier than right it should be um, like the, right after B right or someplace in there I'll figure out does there is everyone happy with F and then I'll just figure out where to place it and then in H I'm going to say before voting on any uh, reappointment or new CBC applicant we're going to get the chair feedback okay. Yeah. No, I noticed we're leaving the dates blank, and Lee and I exchanged some thoughts about timing. Uh, he felt that it would be simpler to have it all in the same calendar year, so you, you start January at some point and you finish May or, or June at some point. My comment was uh, better to start in the fall because it enables a sitting board to complete the process before changes to town meeting. So. I would say that we return to the original, which was something like September 1, October 1, whatever the schedule was that we originally had. By the way, hang in here, gang, because we've been at this a long time, and we're really close yeah, to we're finishing up. There. So we, we ask your indulgence. So we're trying to do all CBC appointments at one point in time, or not on a rolling basis like we do now? Well, I think, I think in just as a matter of practice, it'll go more than one or two meetings. It's going to depend upon how many and how many are interested and vacancies. You recall we had some situations where there were, at the same time, there were uh, reappointment, uh, reappointments, there were vacancies. And it sort of depended upon which body, uh, you know, remember we, have one, we also had a long list of everybody on this list is, is, is willing to be reappointed and we just did it wholesale. So uh, my sense is we'll do it uh, with the town manager's guidance and uh, in the most economic way possible, but I don't know that it rises to policy. I think, I mean, if we have enough lead time, we should be able to stagger it out. Since if we were asking who wants to be reappointed and we know what that is, then we can go through that process and and, and stagger it out so it's not all necessarily once. Because, I mean, it's certainly somebody can be appointed even if, if we know someone's not going to serve for another term. Well, someone could be appointed to start when that term is over. I mean, it doesn't have, we don't have to have a vacancy in per se. Uh, can I interrupt? I just received an email from Bruce Nunziata who says our, the SB TV broadcast has stopped. On VPN? Yes. 
I assume. That's yeah. That's news to be careful. Mm -hmm. I, I have a monitor here uh, that's showing what's on the table. Okay. And that's fine. I'll just email them back. It looks like you're frozen. Mm. Uh, not here, just on the channel. But I'll let people know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh huh. By the way, Susan, remember the meeting you asked a question about? Can residents be? So this is the. Oh, this is what we're considering as as the adopted policy. Yes, I. That was one of my questions yep. tonight too. I see you have resident of Shelburne and owner of the Shelburne-based business. Which, I mean, I guess I'm feeling maybe uh, landowners, taxpayers. Mm -hmm have more of a vested interest? Well, we'll assume a business owner is paying paying some freight too, yeah, yeah. A business owner may not be a landowner. Well, they may not own the, the building. They may, may just be paying rent. Well, maybe we think of it in terms of what, what however they would offer mm -hmm. uh, as, as a volunteer. One of and to things was, was that, you know, there are people from outside of our community that are making financial decisions for me. Mm -hmm. And that just didn't set well with me, I guess. Um, I, I do appreciate, though, I mean, I sit on one of these boards myself. And um, I do appreciate all the work going into it and, and being a little more concise like this. I do appreciate that. And I do like some attendance requirements, too. I, I don't think a board can work well if you don't have a certain amount of people attending on a fairly regular basis. Thanks. Have we had that problem? Um. I think you'd have to pull chairs. Yeah. I mean, it, it yeah. wouldn't necessarily. I mean, I've heard be. that there are some concerns. You but. two have the most recent experience as board head I and mean, commission heads. I mean, it can be an issue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Dean, Dean. I might be able to offer a little bit of context. I was going to make this comment later, but um, state statute requires that only a majority of the members of the Planning Commission be resident of the town. I just wanted to make it clear that this town has had a policy on two occasions. Larry Williams Sr. was no longer a resident of the town, served on the Planning Commission, and Tucker Holland. And as far as I know, they did not have businesses located in Shelburne, so it would be a policy change. I also wanted to point out that there are bodies like the Historic Preservation and Review Commission, which were created by a ordinance and the ordinance also calls for the adoption of rules. The statute says that the members of that group are supposed to have certain technical expertise. Sometimes the town uh, is in a position where it can only get that technical expertise um, from someone who lived in the town and moved away. So I just wanted to offer that as some context for this discussion because it does get a little bit complicated for boards like the Planning Commission and the HBDRC, which again is supposed to have architects, historic preservationists, designers, and, and people like that. And there aren't a lot of historic preservationists in Shelburne as one example. The only other thing that I would add in this, and I'm sorry. I, I mean, because it just struck me that it, somebody else had mentioned this to me, is a concern that we are, we are really um, counting on people to volunteer their time to do this, uh, any of these things. And when, when we get to the point of, of businesses and, and um, people who have actually an economic interest in the activities are going on, there may be a greater motivation for people who have an economic interest to be members of a committee, which may or may not affect the decisions of that committee, if that is um, an option. So it's just something I thought I would bring up that, you know, in some ways there may not be a, a, a sort of a level playing field per se in that um, if you're asking for, you know, uh, people to do this out of the goodness of their heart versus someone who has a direct ec economic interest as a, a, a business owner might. 
I'm not saying that's not the case. It just that's been it has been brought up to me as a concern. That's why we have a conflict of interest policy. Yes, and I think that would be. Okay. So I I just want to note that I, I agree with Dean. I think maybe we're going a little too far on the residency requirement. Maybe if we just added something that said residency requirements may be waived if an appointment requires technical or related professional expertise. Right? Because he's right. I mean, the HPDRC is a good example of, I think you'd never have a full committee assembled without some of those people who don't live in Shelburne, but so these are in cases of, of legislatively legislatively mandated. Uh, if you had a board that profession professional, if for some reason you didn't have residents putting their hands up for an appointment and had a very interested candidate in South Burlington, that yeah, right. About a volunteer. I think it should be up to the to us ultimately to say yes. That is in the best interest of the town. A volunteer who has specific. Expertise. Well, we did that with the cemetery commission. Right. That was the genealogist uh, exactly. from That's from Heinsberg. So, we've done that. Uh, uh, I thought it, uh, I thought it was important to establish residency as as a, as a principal requirement. But uh, I think it's that's good that's the, pretty com you know that's a pretty compelling comment uh, uh, on Dean's part, Sarah. I think it's important that we first look at the Shelburne residents because I feel bad that you're saying that we don't qual we don't have the people that qualify and I think we do I think they're out there but a lot of them are feeling like there's no place on the board for them because you're getting people from outside yeah, but I just think that we really should look at the Shelburne people that live here. I think that they have the financial interest, they live here, and I think it's important that we tap into them. I don't think anyone disagrees no, I, with yeah, that, no, and this, adding this doesn't limit that. Yeah. I think so. the exceptions we can make where, sta where, where state law says or requires a certain uh, a, a professionalism on a committee and there are only three in Chittenden County, and the, none of them happen to reside here. Uh, we would be we would be uh, in a situation of just simply having to go outside. But there's no question that the priority and uh, uh, the hope for result is is a as a resident. So okay, agree with you. If I bring back to the and I know this is a minor point, but the student non-voting members. This is what I was trying to remember. We open this up to CVU, which means that there could be a, a resident of Williston or Hinesburg, um, but because they're at CVU and it's CVU students going there and they're trying to recruit other students to be on the committees, which not all of the student uh, um, positions are filled. Right. And so it's a great opportunity for, for a, a student that's goes to class, is friends with, um, with our children, and if that position isn't being filled, it would be sad to not be able to offer it to them. I think there should be a prioritization, you know, as she said, that, um, you know, if there was two applicants, then obviously the one that's a resident or fulfills, like, the first four should be given priority. So maybe that is applicable in the same situation as if you have two, applica two applicants and with, for technical experience and one of them is a Shelburne resident, of course it would go to the right. Shelburne resident. Uh, with all due respect, I wouldn't see that compelling. I, I would see legislatively determined membership compelling but in this case I would look I would make the judgment that that our population includes enough of a pool of students from whom we could recruit members of committees without going to those who live elsewhere I don't think that reflects recent experience though right I think we've had a problem actually getting students well I don't, I don't on know. some of the board good question about experience I'm not and aware if we have of someone that's at CVU who happens to live in Hinesburg yeah. but wants to serve on the Planning Commission then why wouldn't we For a year, welcome him or her too? right who cares if they live across a political border well, right if they're going to I would think they should be members of local local families but I'm not, we, aware we, I'm not aware we just of said, recruiting problems. But what if we We're, said what yeah. Colleen just stated, Shelburne residents shall be given priority. If you have two candidates, all things being equal, 
Yeah, but the point is, we'll far, the, I don't think we've had more than one applicant that's, ever. That's a nice problem to have. If we're I think it would help with recruiting, to be honest, because the more people, who, the more kids that serve, the more word gets out. Because that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to recruit other members, and uh, but that hasn't really happened. Well, I guess the question is why? Why would if the student is interested? Why wouldn't they participate in their own towns? Their towns aren't have, don't, they don't they have, may have not these opportunities. Have a particular committee. There may be someone who's already on the committee who's a student, and there's no vacancy, right? Or there's other towns that don't have this opportunity. They're not doing this. Yeah. They're not doing what Shelburne's doing. Shelburne yeah. was actually, I think, one of the first in the state. It was Middlebury and then Shelburne. In my mind, the important Manchester. thing is not the member. The important thing is the committee. The committee's functioning in, on behalf of Shelburne, not providing opportunities for others as, as, okay, as, as, as a be, student yeah. was still situation. be functioning on behalf yeah. of Shelburne. And I, have, yeah. I guess we're going to disagree right. on that. I, I mean, I, yeah. I think you have a much richer conversation when you have people who, whether it's age, right, whether it's a technical background, right, like someone who comes with a very robust historic preservation background contributes a lot more, I think, to that committee than someone who I may know nothing just, about I it. It's when you just have hard for me to understand how that distinction is going to be applied to students. I can understand the distinction based on, the, on, on her genealogical background and her familiarity with, with cemetery records. I don't see how a student is going to be distinguished for what, what background and expertise, God bless, are they going to offer us? Well, I don't well, think that it's the, what we're offering them. Yeah, right. the students were a different they're. situation. I don't think this is an offer by us, so much as it, it's a standing committee or or a, a, an impermanent committee doing a job for the town. I guess we're just going to we agree fine, to disagree. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'm stuck on uh, expertise, so I added Roman five, an applicant who has specific expertise in the subject matter over which the CBC has jurisdiction. Where is that? So, Does that um, ring a bell, Dean? Eligibility for appointment. We were saying that the first four criteria were too narrow because there might be circumstances where we have an applicant who has specialized expertise. Oh, I, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm adding. You're and, wordsmithing this? A little bit. Okay. I just want to make sure Go I've ahead. got folks' uh, imprimatur on this. It's so an applicant who has specific expertise in the subject matter over which the CBC has jurisdiction. Yeah. Okay. That's, That's good with me. Right. Yeah. Good with me. Yeah. Could I, could I just ask a question about that? So um, it sounds like sometimes we have people who have specific expertise. They're not residents of Shelburne, and you want them on your committee because they have that expertise. So could you perhaps set it up so that they are non-voting members of the committee? Um, no, I'm not talking about the students. I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm not talking about the students. No. I'm talking about the committees with full members, um, because I personally kind of agree um, that it's, it is kind of hard to have someone who doesn't actually live in Shelburne and actually pay taxes be in a position where they're really allowed to vote on a decision that impacts us. But you want their expertise, so couldn't they be some kind of just non-voting member who provided their expertise um, and then the, the committee itself would go on. My, my, actually, I have two questions. My other question is completely not something I've heard, and that is, so the trustees have term limits, and I know, like, the select board has term limits. Do other committees in town have term limits yeah. or not? Um, actually, in, in... In terms of, I don't mean, like, in terms of they get reappointed, but uh, how many times they can get reappointed. That's what I'm asking. No, not of which no. I'm aware. No. no. It's an unlimited okay. number of so terms, but there are. Okay, so yeah. that's true Both, for me, because you know. it's not true for the trustees. Our bylaws yeah. limit us to two, three-year terms. No. So. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Do you, um, think, do you think we should? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I, I might consider it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it, it does seem like there are some committees in town that it's have had the same on people it. on it right. for like 20 years, and it's not that they're not doing a good job and their contributions are not valued. It's just that sometimes it'd be nice to have a, fresh perspective. a, a yeah. different yeah. perspective. Come up. Whatever. Well, you have one set who have term limits called elections, and but that's a but that's an interesting point. Uh, uh, that's a really interesting point. Um, 
Some uh, of the committees. The folks have, over the years, acquired, in my, appear, my opinion, some invaluable historic memory and experience, because some of the committees do have, are technical. Um, so they can, that can be very valuable. So it's a balancing, I think. I'm going to suggest <laughs> you never thought you'd hear it from me. I really counted on having extra orange cream in the refrigerator because I really counted on having this done tonight. <laughs> but uh, this has been a wonderful discussion. I We've we, can yeah. Can I just make one more point sure. before we terminate? Um, there's on the last page of the rule under Roman four expectation. No, yes, ro expectations for appointee service. There was um, a. Um, Individual CBCs are encouraged to adopt rules of procedure. Um, and Lee suggests leaving that out. I wanted to have a quick discussion on that, because after yeah. that, I think I can get this rule in hopefully mm -hmm. approvable or votable. Next time, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, I the, so the question here was not whether the board should have their own rules, I think they should. My question was whether they yeah. should be allowed to vote their own members off the island, and my suggestion right. is that should only vest with this right. board. Right. Yeah. I think we're all agreed. We have, yeah, without, a, without, without board knowledge, but that's not the strength of this suggestion, so, I so we agree. leave individual CBCs are encouraged to adopt rules and procedures? Yep. And just yep. Leave it at that? Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Good job, Sorry. super. Are we all uh, okay with uh, yes. awaiting Good next, progress. next, <laughs> next week? Thank you so very much. Thank everybody. Uh, Thanks for your indulgence. We're, we appreciate it. Uh, the next item is Village Center Safety Traffic Study Synthesis. Uh, Lee and Josh are going to lead this discussion with Dean's active participation. No? I, I oh. to make a comment. Okay. You under rules, I just wanted the board to consider in this context. There are many committees that were created as a result of charters several mm -hmm. years ago. There are some bodies like the DRB that were created as a result of resolution. Yeah, I think it would help future boards and members of committees if your policy had language that explains the impact of the policy relative to these other charters or the rule or the resolution that was adopted to create this this DRB. I'm a sense I'm sensing you don't want to go back and revisit any of those things. But if you don't say something about it, you may have conflicts between okay. this new policy and these actions that previous sports have taken. Just a heads up. Okay. There like are, a separability clause or something like that. Well, you simply may want to have language that says this policy is intended to uh, will be deemed superior to any conflicting language okay. found in the the charters that were cre used to create the committees or that were imposed on the committees. How many, how many committees do you think that, that, that affects? Um, I think that, well, I know that I pay attention to the charter that was created for the Natural Resources Committee, that was created for the Paths Committee. Um, those are the two main ones. But at one point, I believe it was done for those committees and for REC and I know that the select board many, many years ago went through a process of updating charges for committees. And I'm just drawing attention that's possible that there would be language in this that might conflict, and you want this to override that. Good point. Ex put it in there. Right. Thank you, Dean. No downside. OK. Thank you. OK. Josh, Lee, you want to? Sure. So this is an outgrowth of a number of recent conversations about village pedestrian safety matters, bike ped path matters, and the longer term transportation studies that have been done, and how might we move forward with all of these and blend this work together. And Josh and I had a great conversation about it. And what we're proposing is a two track but parallel process. First track being that I will meet with the Village Safety Group and the Bike Ped Paths Committee. We've now come to agreement that we're going to bring those two groups together at the Paths meeting on the 23rd and just revisit what were those projects that were contemplated during the budget conversations and which were contemplated for funding and just gain clarity on where we're going with all those, which projects are ready to launch 
and what's the process to move forward with those, <coughs> which ones might need to be revisited. We don't know all those answers yet. For example, there was discussed during the budget conversation that the town would fund the creation of a gravel path between the Bay Road fishing access and the Bay Park. We've now learned that that entire property may be deemed an official wetland, and we may or may not be able to do work there or move the dog park there. We are going to contract with a wetlands expert to do that analysis and figure that out. But anyway, so in the short term, those two groups that have come up with a number of great ideas, we're going to sit down together and figure out how to get those pieces moving forward. At the same time, Josh and I have committed to reviewing the constellation of transportation studies that have been done in the past. We'll put together some lists of what the recommendations are in each of those studies, do what we sometimes call a crosswalk analysis, where are there synergies or similarities in recommendations. Um, which projects are easily achievable, which ones are more difficult, what's the best bang for the buck, and try to create some synergy and some clarity around those various studies. Feed that into the Planning Commission, who hopefully will agree to host a conversation as a part of the town plan process, so that while we're working on the short-term projects that we've funded and agreed might be helpful, we're also looking at the bigger picture and creating that context that can then inform the town plan process, can inform the capital budgeting process moving forward, and keep everything moving, hopefully, in a clear and organized fashion within that larger context. That's the strategy we propose. We're not here tonight to discuss any other studies or specific projects. We just hoped to gain your blessing that that sounds like a logical and helpful strategy. I've talked with Jane, and I've also talked with Kevin, and they both seem in agreement that this would be a useful approach. No, I agree. I think uh, Leah summarized it well. I mean, I think it, it gives us the flexibility uh, both to examine what has been done plus uh, opportunity to um, solicit input on, on that, but occurring within the framework of what um, is already happening. Um, and so I think it seems like a reasonable way to move forward. So I think that we have to start somewhere. Um, I'm curious to see what the first um, iteration of this will be. I, one thing that was um, something, I don't know if it's something to worry about, but just something to keep uh, in the back of your mind is when you said about um, you know, trying to uh, summarize what each study offers and then uh, putting it in these lists of like more, which one gives us the more bang for your, for, for the buck, um, that there's like a subjective component to it too. So it's the idea of giving data, but then giving a subjective spin and then handing it to the planning commission. So the planning commission isn't exactly getting um, like a, a a conclusion made from objective data in a study, they're given a list that's been summarized, right, by other minds. Right. We're not intending to prejudge those things, what should be priorities, but at the same time, if we just give the Planning Commission a collection of lists that may or may not be helpful in their next step in holding a public summit or conversation or call it what we will. So we're not proposing to prejudge those, mm -hmm. but at least offer some clarity and guidance around that collection of lists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, if there were ideas for major changes to Route 7, that's not really in our control. So we're not going to, it's not our place to say don't pursue those, but realize some of these are going to have more significant challenges to implement than others. Mm -hmm. So it will be primarily data-driven, not subjective. No. I'm going to uh, step in here even before, Jane, you and Kevin comment, although we would be interested to hear it. But uh, our information is that there's no broadcast, uh, hasn't been, and there is not now. And my sense is we should put this item on the agenda for the next meeting. Sorry. But there should be some assurance for the public that they can, they can uh, uh, watch and, and learn and question. And apparently, at this moment, uh, we're without that capability. The, the, the stream on the, we're going on the stream on the VCAM website. 
website, it's frozen. Um, for some reason, my messages to the station are not being through yeah. um, to let them know to refresh the feed. Uh, the recording is, is good. Um, it will be available on the website. It's just not live. It's, uh, you're, you're sort of frozen on the, oh, well. on the screen. I think there might be something wrong with Wi-Fi in here. Is, yeah. I've been having it has been bouncing on and off all yeah. night. So that might be why. But um, if they're still recording, then it's probably, it's, it'll okay. go on there. We, All right, so it's still accessible. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Where were we? Sorry. We were soliciting reactions. We were asking Jane and Kevin if they wanted to comment. I have no other comments than to say that I think this makes total sense and is kind of the both the, the broad brush look at things that are going to bring some um, sense to what's already out there um, and also keep us moving ahead with the things on the short term. So I'm in total agreement with this plan and I look forward to meeting with the bike paths committee in another week or so. Yeah, fully supportive of this idea as well. And Colleen, to your point, yeah, we would not want it to turn into a subjective discussion. And I think, um, Lee, you've addressed that as well, you know, coming up with what we've looked at, what we've talked about before in the past, and coming up to you guys and the, and the other boards with ideas of what makes the most sense moving forward. So absolutely, keeping it in-house makes a lot of sense for saving money for us, you know, but having some people that have some experience, Lee and, and Josh yourself, looking at these studies makes a lot of sense. So. Fully supportive of it, absolutely. Thanks, Sure. Any other discussion? Any other comment? I like the idea of keeping things simple, so thank you for that. I agree that we didn't necessarily need another committee, but as we struggled to figure out the direction on this, it was just an idea. So thank you for putting your hand up, Josh, and, and Lee, for helping steer us through what looks to be a good path forward. Especially good that we're not establishing another committee before we do our policy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's tiny. I, too, would like to thank Lee and Josh. Uh, I know they've spent a considerable amount of time and have met with a number of people, Jane and Kevin, among others. Uh, it's, uh, I think they're making a very valuable contribution, and uh, uh, their effort is really appreciated. We thank you, Lee and Josh. Any other comments? We're preparing to adjourn. Any, any discussion? Is there a motion? Second. Colleen moves, Jamie seconds. Aye. Aye. Thank you, and those opposed? Thank you very much, thank you for coming.